everybody, this is Carol from Segovia Quilts and today I'm going to be showing you how to complete a quilt from putting your sandwich together all the way through the quilting and the binding process. Now this video is not going to show you how to do the quilt top. If you're looking to learn how to do the quilt top, go ahead and check out this video that I have. And once you get your top all completed, make sure to come on back here and I'll show you how to actually put it together and quilt it and then put on your binding. So this is the quilt we're going to be making today. All right, so we've, before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and show everybody what I did to the shirts before I put my quilt top together. And this is one of the shirts, well, this is actually one of the back of the shirts, so I won't be using this particular section of material, but I wanted to show you that I do stabilize or I put interfacing on the back of all of my t-shirts and my t-shirt quilts. So now this is the difference. This is the shirt without interfacing and stabilizer and this is, this is it with the stabilizer on. So now right here this edge is not completely um, ironed down which is fine. This I was using the bottom part for extra material if need be. But um, this is it and it irons on and like I said I didn't go all the way down here because I knew I wasn't going to need that much so you could peel it off if you really really wanted to a little bit. Um, but this is what the back of all of my shirts look like. So, um, but again, I give instructions on how to do this in this other video. So if you, you know, if you've never worked with this or if you don't really know what I'm talking about, make sure to check out that video. So, um, yeah, all of my shirts have been processed. I've cut them all. I've put my quilt top together. My um, my border is on. Everything is done and ready and good to go. So let's go ahead and move on to the first step of actually putting your quilt together. And it's going to be where I lay out the backing fabric and then I put the batting on top and then I'm going to lay my quilt top on top of that and um, show you guys how to get started. Alright, so let's go ahead and get started today. Okay, so I went ahead and I laid out my backing fabric. Now, this fabric was provided to me by my client, and it's not your standard fabric that's about 44 inches wide from selvage to selvage. Um, this is the larger fabric, which this one measures, it's about 104, so 104 inches from selvage over here to selvage over here. Um, and then whatever yardage she got, which I believe is two yards. Um, now I went ahead and I taped it to the floor. You can see my little pieces of tape over there and then I taped um, the entire length of the selvage on both sides and I taped on this side too. Um, now I did that so that I could pull the fabric really nice and tight. This way I wouldn't have to worry about there being potential you know, creases in the backing while I'm quilting it together. So I went ahead and did that. And so now the next step is going to be to lay out my batting. and. This is the batting that I've chosen. Now this is Mountain Mist Quilt Light Batting. Now this is a low loft batting, which is usually what I use. Um, this one is 100% polyester, which is usually what I use also. Sometimes I use a poly cotton blend. Um, it's usually just kind of always a low loft though. Um, I don't ever use anything heavier unless the client specifically asks for something heavier. And I do that because it keeps the quilt kind of light and it doesn't let it get super hot. Um, so this is what I use. This is a queen size. So now what I'll go ahead and do is I'll go ahead and lay this over top of my backing fabric. Um, so I'll go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so my batting's all laid out. And what I do is I just kind of lay it loosely in the middle of the backing fabric. And then starting in the middle, I work my way to each edge, smoothing it out, and then I work my way out to each corner, smoothing it out. Um, I didn't use any basting spray because I do my basting with needles, so right now it's just laid on there. There's nothing really keeping it together except the friction of the two, um, of the batting and the fabric underneath. So now, I'm going to go ahead and lay my quilt top on top of it and pretty much do the same thing, start in the middle, just kind of spread it out. Um, so I'll go to leave the camera on and show y'all how I do that. And 
because I'm doing this on the floor, I'm not wearing shoes because I will be stepping on it. So, um, yeah, just kind of little extra tidbits. So let me go ahead and get the bat or the uh, the quilt top, and I'll go ahead and start laying that out too. All right, so this is my top. Now I know for a fact that the quilt top is much smaller than the backing fabric and the batting, which is fine. It's good to have extra room around the edges. Just kind of doing it loosely right now. I'm not really trying to center it or anything. Um, but because my quilt top is so much smaller than the backing fabric, that gives me room to move it around um, just to make sure I have enough edges on all sides. So that's good. So I'm just going to keep doing this. I'm going to, I think I'm going to move it up a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to smooth it out, and then I can actually start doing my pinning. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust it up. Okay, so I shifted my quilt top up and a little bit out that way. Um, I smoothed down the whole top part already, but I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how I do the bottom part, just in case you've never done it before. So I'm going to start in the middle of my quilt, which I've just kind of been using the pink block as my middle. So I'll go ahead and show you guys what I do. So I just start in the middle, and I work my way down, smoothing it out, pressing it with my hands. There. And I just do a quick one that way. Come to the side. some pressure on my hands just to make sure it's got a good contact with the batting because that'll help keep it in place. between my quilt top and the backing fabric, so that's good. But you definitely want to check. So check over here, I'm good on that side. There. And then if you see anything, you know, that looks a little not as flat as you want it, just run your hand across the top of it. throughout the whole time that I'm pinning my quilt top. As I'm pinning, I smooth it out and then I pin that block. And then I move and then I smooth it out and I pin. So I'm always smoothing to make sure it's nice and flat once I go to quilt it together. So now I'm gonna actually start basting my quilt. And I use safety pins to do it, so I have a big old bag of them. So I'm just gonna start in the middle and show you guys how I baste it. Now these blocks are 14 by 14 inches. So they're good size blocks. So I like putting four pins in each block. And I just kind of put it spread out in the block. So I'll go ahead and do that. Now I won't show you guys me basting the entire quilt. I'll just do a couple of blocks for y'all because it's going to be the same throughout the entire quilt. So 
just spread it out. You can see a little ripple here from where I had folded it once I completed the quilt top, but that's all right. So I'm just going to start in the corner. Now I push, now there is a, a rug underneath here, um, but that's all right. What I do is I push my pin all the way through and then I pick it up so it's out of the carpet and then I just bring it back through. So it's not connected, but it is all the way through the batting and the backing fabric. So I've done that before. Um, I was working on a personal quilt and I had, there was a couple of safety pins that were stuck in the carpet underneath. So just be careful if you're doing this over carpet. So, I've got this one block done. Now, I like to stay several inches away from these seams because I will quilt in all of these seams for every block. So, I don't want to have to be bothered with taking pins out, you know, if I'm too close to one of the seams. At least this way, I can just start at one seam and go the whole length of the quilt and not worry about it. So, now, I'm going to the next one, smoothing as I go. And you want to do this pretty much for all of your quilts, not just, you know, t-shirt quilts or um, squares. I mean, you can do it for any kind of shape, really. So now, this particular shirt, this logo is, um, I think it's screened on. It's not, um, I mean, it's a different kind of print. So if I put a needle through this white part, it will leave a hole. So with that, I'm going to try and get it in the purple parts, this way I don't leave a hole in the logo itself. So right here, I just went through this P, and you'll never even know that there's a pin in there. And over here, I'm just going to go through this little purple ring. There we go. I got those two blocks done. So this is what I'm going to keep doing for every block on here. Now I've got five blocks this way by six blocks this way. So, <laughs> yeah, 30 blocks, well, 28 blocks to go, and then I'll be done pinning. Um, I will also pin my border. So let me show you guys that. All right. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can get a better idea. Okay, so for the border, what I like to do is I'll put a pin in these seams right here. I'll pin it this way, and possibly here, depends, because um, I won't actually quilt the border until I finish doing all of my lines. So, make sure you guys can see that. Yeah, I won't actually quilt the seams on the border until I finished all of my lines in the quilt. So by the time I do that, the border, I mean, it's only a three inch border, um, so I won't have to pin in between each little seam line. But um, if you have a larger border, you know, you definitely want to make sure it's secure before you get to quilting in that area. Or you could have ripples or puckers, and then that won't be good. All your hard work will be, you know, kind of ruined by a pucker. <laughs> so, let me zoom back out. There you go. All right, so yeah, I'm going to keep basting the rest of my quilt, and then we'll come back and move on to the next section. Okay, so I went ahead and finished basting all of that part of the quilt and that section over there, but I left this last little corner here unbasted so that I could show you guys how I do the corners, just because obviously that's where you're going to have the most loose material. So I'm going to go ahead and baste these four blocks here. Zoom in a little bit. There, all right. So I'm going to start from the inside of the quilt and work my way out that way. So I just push 
And I do this several times before I actually put my pins in. Not just the corners, but all of the blocks. Alright, so now I'll work on this one. And I like pushing from the pin line. So I had all of these here, but I want to get as close to those pins that are already anchored so I can start pushing here and push it out. Because the fabric from here in isn't going to move because it's already secured. So I want to start from the pin line and then push my way out. Look at how nice and flat that's laying. Again, I do this throughout the whole quilt. And this particular quilt is a simple style quilt, but I do the same process for my collage style quilts as well. Alright, see, I only got two more blocks left to go, so I'm going to move my pins over this way. moves just a little bit. Alright, and again I'm putting four pins in each block. You can put more if you like. There you go. And the batting that I'm using says to do your quilting about five inches apart, so my pins are, eh, I think they're a little more spaced than that. I think these are probably, this one's probably about seven or eight inches apart, but these two are much closer. So you can put as many as you like. You can put one in the middle, um, and you can go across the seam lines. I just didn't because I don't want to have to worry about removing the pins while I'm quilting it together. There we go. All right, so we got one block left. <clears throat> okay. There we go. All right. So there's that. Okay. So go ahead and whoops, zoom out. Okay. So the whole thing is. Basted, and you probably can't see it too well just because the pins are so light or they're so tiny. But the whole thing is basted minus the border. So I'll go ahead and do the border. I'll go ahead and start down here at the bottom. And I'll zoom in a little bit. There. And right there. Okay. I'm just going to pin in the seam lines. So I'm just going to push. I'm going to do the same thing. And I, I'm going straight off onto my batting so they'll both be nice and tight. And I'm going to actually pin towards the edge because I want to make sure that this stays in place. So I'm probably about a quarter inch away from the edge of my border. So I'll just keep doing this throughout the rest of my border until I get all of my seam lines pinned down. But let me go ahead and show you the corner, because I do like pinning the corner down, even though there's not a seam line. So, bring my hands over.
Okay. But this took me, I think maybe, I don't even think 20 minutes to get it all basted. Um, obviously, it'll determine, it'll be determined by how big your quilt is, how many quilt blocks you have, um, how intricate it is, and also by the kind of quilting you're actually going to be doing. Um, for this particular quilt, it's a stray pin, um, for this particular quilt, I'm going to be quilting in all of the seam lines, so here, here, and then also up and down. And then because these blocks are so large, I can't, I can't just go with the seam lines and that's it. I have to do my quilting a lot closer than that. So what I'll do is I'm going to go into each individual block. So I'll zoom into that purple and white one right there. So for that particular block, I'm going to do, you can call it trace quilting or maybe even echoing. I don't know if echoing is the right term for it. But I'm going to quilt around the logo. So that'll keep it nice and secure. And I might actually even quilt in that little squiggly line right there because that's purple shirt. It's not the logo. So my needle won't, you know, be piercing the logo. So I'll probably quilt in that little line right there just to give it a little bit more extra secureness or maybe even in this purple line that goes around. And let's see. Here's a good one. So this one. I'm going to quilt, there's a little line right along here, I'll quilt in there, and then I'll also do this little circle right here, and I might do a little bit in the palm tree, just so that it's spread out, there's quilting kind of all throughout the block. Now this one is going to be a little bit more difficult. Because the logo is only on the top portion of the shirt, that leaves a good, I don't know, maybe seven inches of the block, uh, maybe more like eight or nine inches of the block, where I don't have anything in there where I can quilt. So, hmm, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do there. I might just do um, two little slits, kind of where my pins are, and I'll just go up and down possibly. Um, and the thread that I use, I use a clear monofilament thread on the top of all of my quilts, so you can't see it. And because I use such a low loft batting, you really can't even see where the quilting is at unless you're really looking at it. So if I just did two small little slits, you really wouldn't even be able to see it. Um, but we'll see how it comes out. I'm not sure. I don't know. I might try and think of something else to do in there. Because I got two blocks kind of like that. There's that one and that one right there where the quilting or the logo is kind of up in one section of the shirt so it'll pose a little bit of a problem when it comes to quilting but those are the only two blocks that I see that are like that so alright so like I said I'm gonna go ahead and finish um, basting my border and then we'll come back and move on to the next step Okay, so now that the basting is all completed on the quilt, it's time to move on to the next step. And I went ahead and I already took off the tape that I had securing my backing fabric. I took it off from all the edges um, because now we're going to actually trim along the edges and cut off the excess batting and backing fabric. So I'm going to go ahead and start over in that corner and you won't be able to see me for the first few seconds until I get back, you know, to this area. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut probably about two inches away from the quilt top um, and I know a lot of people they'll tell you to leave you know I think four to six inches on each side but that's really if you're going to be going um, if you're going to take your quilt to a long arm quilter because they have to put clamps on the backing fabric and it pulls it nice and tight but since I'm not going to be doing this on a long arm, I'm going to go ahead and cut it to about two inches away because um, that's really all that I need. So I'm going to go ahead and start in that corner and then I'll work my way down.
fabric plus all of this excess of batting. And that, um, you can either, you know, hang on to it and use it for other quilt projects, or you could throw it away. I mean, I, I would hope you wouldn't throw, the, throw it away because this is a lot of batting and you can, you know, make placemats with it or even some miniature quilts or some wall hangings. There's a whole bunch of stuff you could do with it. So this is my excess backing fabric. So I'm just going to fold this up and kind of put it off to the side for now. Here we go. So, but I'm going to do the same thing along all four edges. Now, over on my other two corners, let's see. Over on those two edges, I don't have near as much excess as I did over here and as I do on this um, edge down here. So with that, I could probably get away with not even having to trim off the edges. Um, this one, obviously, I still have a lot, so I am going to trim this one. But over there, I might not need to. But we'll see. I don't know. Once I'll go, I'm going to go over there and pull up the, bat the batting and see how much space or how much background material I still have over there, and then I'll decide from there. But, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and trim off this edge, and then pretty much it'll be on to the next step, which is the actual quilting process. All right, so let me get this done, and then we'll get on to the next step. Okay, so I went ahead and finished trimming off the edges, but I wanted to show you guys. Um, I was getting ready to pick it up, and I figured, let me show you all what it looks like once you get it all basted down and what it should look like if you don't accidentally baste it to the carpet underneath. So, go ahead and pick up this edge here. See, so it's coming up nicely. I've not pinned it to the carpet underneath, which is very good. So I'm just going to fold it over so you guys can get a better look at it. So, zoom in a little bit. Now you can just barely see some of the pins there, there. It's pretty hard because of the, um, the color of the fabric. It's pretty dark. But, there. If you look at it, it looks relatively nice and smooth. Let me zoom out a little bit. So if you just give it a tug, there. there, see, so there aren't any creases or, I mean, there's, you know, little puckers and such because my fabric was pulled tight and my pins are going through it, but there aren't any creases. A lot of what you're seeing, I think, is probably shadow because I've got my door open back there. This is better. I just stepped over here. There. See, but that's pretty much what you want your back to look like. Now, if you saw somewhere in there where it was folded over and you pinned it like that, now is the time to fix it because if you sew through that and you, you know, I mean, that's it. You're going to have to go back and pull out, I don't even know how many stitches, and then relay everything out and then pull your back fabric tight and it'll just be a pain. So I suggest before you move on to the next step, look at the back and make sure it looks good because yeah, once you start quilting it, ugh, I don't even, ooh, I couldn't even imagine having to undo it and fix something like that. So um, yeah, so we can fold this up and look at this side. All right. So we'll come close again. There. See? That looks good. I don't see any puckers or anything where, well, any folds where it'll, you know, pose a problem. And then we'll flip over the last little bit. So that's the last bit, and it looks good to me. I don't see any folds or anything that'll pose a problem once I get to the quilting process. There we go. 
Beautiful. All right, and I just would like to say, before I laid everything down, I did give my whole living room a good vacuum. Because um, we do have a dog. He's over there in the corner. And the last thing I want is for there to be dog hair all over my client's quilt. So I made sure to give it a good vacuuming before I laid everything out. And now we're done with the floor part. So now I'm going to gather it up and take it to my sewing table, and we'll get on to the next step. All right, so the next step is to actually start quilting the quilt. Um, and I've already got everything all put together. You guys already saw that. And so I went ahead and laid it on top of my quilting table. And I actually have my extension table under here. And this just gives me a little bit of a bigger surface that I can use to move the quilt around. I have my quilting gloves to help me move the fabric around. This yellow side, um, there's a fabric on the side and then this is a yellow rubber. It helps kind of grip the, the fabric and lets you move it around a little bit easier. Um, I also went ahead and put in my clear monofilament thread that I like using for my quilt tops. Um, because the backing fabric is mostly black, I will be using a black thread for my bobbin. So that will blend in very nicely. The settings that I'm running on my sewing machine is I have my stitch length set at 2. And this is a Juki TL2010Q, so I have my speed set right in the middle. Um, tension on the bobbin and the upper is normal. Um, I did have to adjust it a little bit because of the monofilament thread. Uh, what else? Oh, and I went ahead and I put my walking foot on. Let me go ahead and show you guys that in case you don't know what a walking foot is. There you go. So this foot, it has feet underneath the presser foot, and what it does is it helps grab the fabric and feed it through, and so it works in conjunction with your feed dogs, which are on the bottom, so you get a nice even feed on the top and the bottom. So I went ahead and put that on. And just as a little side note, for anybody that has a Juki TL2010Q or is thinking about it, when you have your walking foot on, you cannot use the automatic needle threader. Um, there is a little arm right here from the walking foot that when you try pushing the needle threader down, it hits it right there. So you can't actually thread the needle. <laughs> so I learned that the first time I tried using this, but I figured I'd just throw that out there. So go ahead and zoom back out. Here we go. All right. So what I'm going to do is I went ahead and I... I have the quilt in my sewing machine and it's sitting here in the throat space. But what I did is I'm going to start in the middle of the quilt and I'm going to sew down one of the lines. So I'm just going to start here and I'm going to go all the way down. Since it's not a collage style, I'll be able to sew through all the rows here, which is three. And then I'm going to do that for all of the bottom rows. And then once I do the bottom, I'm going to flip it around and I'm going to do the top. Um, now I'm doing that to try and get more of an even um, stitch, I guess you could, well not really even stitch. I'm doing that because I feel like if I was to start at the very top and come down, like it might shift some of the fabric around a little bit and to try and alleviate that I'm just going to start in the middle and sew down and then flip it around and go in the middle and then go up. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's just what I usually like to do, but you can do it however you want to do it. If you want to start at the top and just go all the way down, go ahead. I mean, it's not going to move the fabric, you know, inches at a time. It might be a little bit off, but it's not going to be, you know, inches. So, what I'll go ahead and do is I'll go ahead and get situated, and then I'll zoom in and show you guys um, the first stitch line. Okay, so... I've got my quilt placed where it needs to be. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring my bobbin thread up. And to do that, you just lower the needle once, then bring it back up, and pull that thread right up. If I can grab it. <laughs> All right, there. Okay. 
So I've got my black bobbin and my clear top thread, and I'm just going to pull it to the back. There you go. And I'm going to set down my presser foot. I'm going to go ahead and do locking stitches when I start off. So all that is, is you're going to come forward a couple of stitches and then go backwards and then come back. And that just makes sure that your thread isn't going to come out. Since I'm starting in the middle of the quilt instead of at the very edge, I need to make sure that that stitch isn't going to come out at all. So, go ahead and start. And then go back. There. All right. So now I'm going to be sewing through the entire seam line all the way to the end of the quilt. Now what this is called, this is called stitching in the ditch because you are going to be stitching right in between the two blocks right here. And the, the trick is to get it right between the two fabrics. Um, I mean, it, it does happen where you might go over onto one side of the fabric a little bit, but um, it's, you know, since it's a clear thread, it's not going to be that noticeable, honestly. So I'm going to go ahead and put my glove on, and this will just help me feed it, feed the quilt through a little bit better. Um, I'm just going to have it on one hand there because this side is pretty open, so I won't have too much of a hard time feeding this side of the quilt. So I'm just going to get a big old bunch down here. I'm just going to flatten it out, and let's get going. And then as you quilt down your line, you just want to readjust the rest of the quilt to make sure it's not getting snagged on anything and to make sure it's not hanging down and preventing you from feeding it through. And each time you're going to start, just want to smooth it out. By pulling the fabric apart, you're going to be opening up that ditch right there for you to get your needle right in between the two. Okay. And it gets easier as you get closer to the bottom. <laughs> okay, so that was one row that we just got through. Two more to go for this line. second row. Okay, and you just have to maneuver the quilt as you go. You want it to be nice and flat where you're working. Okay, and we're coming into the last row. making sure there's nothing underneath. Sometimes your quilt can roll under and you can potentially sew it to itself and that's not good. Okay. We're coming up to the end and we're coming up to our border. Now because this quilt has a border, I can't just sew right off the edge, and I'm sure you guys can't see my fingers, so let me keep sewing here a little bit. Okay, there. 
So, this is my border, and usually what you could do if you didn't have a border, you would just keep sewing and you would sew right off the edge and into the batting. And when you do that, you don't have to worry about locking your stitch because this edge of the quilt is going to be encased by the binding when you put your binding on. So it would look like that. But since I have a border, I can't just sew right off the edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the edge right here between the block and the border, and then I'm going to do a back stitch and come back. So let's go ahead and do that. There you go. Back stitching a couple of stitches. There you go. And I could cut my thread here, but I'm going to just bring it up and I'm going to cut it myself um, instead of having my machine cut it. There you go. And by doing this, when I bring my thread up for the next row, I'm going to have enough of a tail from my bobbin thread that I'll actually be able to get it up. Because if I use the thread cutter on my machine, it cuts it so short that when you try pulling up your bobbin, you're not going to have enough thread to get it up. Um, which isn't necessarily a problem. You could just do a couple of stitches in one area, and then you don't have to worry about bringing up that bobbin thread. So, now let me show you guys the line that we just did. So let me grab the camera. Okay, so this is the seam line that we just did. So now I'm just going to show you. I'm going to try and open it up so that you guys can see. You can't even see that thread. See? Look. Nothing. It just disappears right into the quilt. And that's why I love using the clear thread because you can't see it at all. So now let me flip it over and show you guys the back. Okay, so now here's the back. See, and you can just see a little bit of the shine from the clear monofilament thread. And then the rest of it is the black thread. I mean, I know it's kind of difficult to see, but that's kind of the point. <laughs> see? So it just disappears right into the backing. Okay, and I'll pull it back out and show you guys some more of the top. So I'm trying to pull it up. Let's see. See, you just really can't even see it. And I think, I think there was a little part where I went off the edge a little bit. Let me see if I can show you guys that. Because, you know, I mean, I am human, so I'm not perfect. I'm not going to get it on there every single time so let's see if I can't adjust the zoom for you there we go okay so see on the green right just a little bit I went onto the green fabric right there and so you can see the little um, the holes from the needle but you can't even see the thread see so if you back out if you back out, it's like it's not even there. <laughs> so that's why I love this clear monofilament thread. And I highly recommend it because it doesn't take away from the quilt itself. It just, it secures it and you don't have to worry about it. All right, so that was this one whole line. So now I'm going to scoot over to the next one and I'm going to go ahead and do the next one. Okay, so now we're ready to do our next row of stitching. And I went ahead, I already brought up my bobbin thread and those two tails are right here. All right, so now, just like the first stitch, I'm going to do a locking stitch. So, go ahead and get a couple of stitches in, and back stitch. There we go. All right, so now, we can start going down the row. Now, the only bad thing <laughs> One of the, well, not really bad things, one of the, I don't know, things that you have to deal with when doing t-shirt quilts is these two t-shirts are pretty close to the same color, which makes it a little bit more difficult to get right in the seam line because you it's hard, in this little presser foot, it's really hard to see the line between the two shirts. But um, it's all right, we'll make do. I'm going to 
try and make sure that this isn't in your way. I hope it's not. So I'm just smoothing this out. I'm going a little bit slower on this one just because it's hard to tell the difference between the two shirts. And I don't want to end up coming off of that seam line and not realize it. So I'm just readjusting. And again, I'm going to check and make sure that there's nothing underneath. progressively more and more challenging as you go, especially I still have one more seam line to do over there, um, and because I'm coming down, that means I have to put all of this into the throat of my machine, which just makes it, you know, more and more difficult to get it to lay nice and flat. So, there's that, and again, I hope this isn't in the way. Okay. Flatten that out. There. Alright, so now we're into fabrics that are two different colors, which makes it a lot easier to be able to get right in between them. Alright, so something else to um, know when you're working with t-shirt fabric is that regular needles, well, there's different kinds of needles. There's a regular needle and there's a ballpoint needle. Now, regular needles, they pierce through the fabric. They go straight through it. A ballpoint needle is not as sharp as a regular needle. And what it does is when it goes into the fabric, because it doesn't have a sharp tip, it has more of a, a rounded tip, it kind of wiggles its way between the fibers of the material. So instead of piercing it, it mm, kind of digs around in it so it doesn't make a hole in it. And that's kind of important to know because t-shirt fabric, um, it is possible for your needle to leave holes in the fabric if you're not using a ballpoint needle. And then over time, you know, washing and use, that hole will start opening up and then your quilt could start, you know, having some issues and need to be repaired. So I am using a ballpoint needle right now. So we're on the second to the last row right now. Let's readjust that. There we go. row. Okay. I'm just going to start pulling the rest of that quilt through. Again, I'm checking the bottom. And we're good there. Pick up the end of this. All right. And these two fabrics are kind of a pain too, because even though they're two different color fabrics, under the presser foot where you have less light, it gets harder to tell where the two fabrics meet up.
back stitch. And there you go. Pull up our needle. And we'll go ahead and cut the thread. Again, you can use your thread cutter. I'm choosing not to. And get that bottom thread. There you go. All right. There you go. So we just finished that line. Okay, and this one, I did come off onto the purple a little bit so you can see the thread a little bit better. So let me grab it. Okay, so here's a seam line that we just did. And let's see if I can get it so you guys can see it a little bit better. It's kind of hard to tell in the camera. There you go. So you can see it a little bit where it's not perfectly in that ditch right there, but it's really close. And again, because I'm using the clear thread, when you back away and zoom out, <laughs> you can't even see it. So now if, if this was white thread, you would be able to, you would definitely be able to see it, especially on this darker fabric, you would be able to see it. Um, so that's why I'm a huge fan of this clear thread. So, okay, so now what I'm going to do, so I'm going to go ahead and finish up. I still have this seam line here, and this is the last row, or last column, I mean. So I'm going to finish up this seam line, and then I still have, I think, two seam lines on the other side of the quilt that I still need to do. So I'm going to go ahead and finish up the bottom, and then I'm going to turn it around and do the top section. And then once I start doing my side-to-side -side rows, I'll go ahead and come back so I can show you guys how to do those or what it's like doing that. Alright guys, so here's the back of the quilt after I just finished quilting down all the um, columns. And there's five columns, so this is column one, two, three, four, five. So you can see, well you can't really see unless I'm kind of standing to block the light so you can see the shadows, but that's it. And let me get close, see if I can zoom in and show you guys the stitching. I mean, you're not really going to be able to see it, honestly, because it just blends right into the fabric. So let me try up here where the light's hitting it a little bit. Let's see if I can get my camera to focus. There you go. Okay. So you can just barely see it. I mean, and that's good. That's what I was going for. That's why I used a black thread back here so you couldn't see it. So that's what it looks like. So I'll go ahead and turn it around so you guys can see the front so far. Okay, so here's the front. And again, I already quilted down this line, or a row, this one, this one, and that one. I've not done the edge for the borders yet. I'm going to do that very last, right before I do the binding. But as you can tell, I mean, you can't really even tell that it's been quilted. You know, I mean, I can grab it right here, and that's really the only way that you know because it's not coming... Oh, it's not coming away from the batting and the backing. But you can't even see the stitching at all. And that's part of why I like using the clear thread and why I do stitch in the ditch. Because I'm securing everything, I'm securing all three layers, and it's not taking away from the t-shirts themselves. So when you look at this, all you're going to see is the shirts. You're not going to see, you know, white thread jumping off from out of the ditch. And, and I don't do an all over quilt pattern on my quilts um, for a couple of reasons. One, I'm still learning how to do it. <laughs> and two, I, I don't want to take away from the shirts because if I did an all over quilt pattern, especially if I did it in white thread, you're going to see it in pretty much all of these shirts because they're all relatively darker colors. I mean, the gray, not so much. That white one up there, you're not going to see it. 
but all of these darker colors you would definitely see in all over quilt pattern. Um, so that's why I just kind of stick with what I do, quilt in the ditch, and then I also do quilting around the individual logos. So now that we're done with the columns, I can go ahead and do the rows, which is going to be quilting in there, 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 and all the way up to the top. Um, now also, there are a couple of shirts. So like this one here is pieced, this one is pieced, and where's the other one? There's one more shirt that I had to piece. Um, oh, there, right next to it. <laughs> so because those are pieced, I will quilt in the lines going across there and in these lines here. Um, it'll just add it, you know, a little bit more secureness, especially this one here, since the logo is on the top part and there's going to be this whole block on the bottom that's not going to have anything in it. So by quilting in that seam right there, it'll help give it that little extra bit of secureness that it needs to stay nice and neat. So I'm going to go ahead and set this up on my machine. And again, I'm going to start in the middle and I'm going to quilt out. Um, now because there are five columns, um, obviously, you know, I'm either going to have to start right here, which is not quite the middle, or there, which is still not quite the middle. So what I'll do is honestly, I'll probably just start right here and then quilt out. And I'll do that all the way down and all the way up. And then once I finish that, I'll flip it around and then I'll quilt the remaining section of the, um, the rows. So let me go ahead and get this set up and then I'll go ahead and show you guys the first couple of the quilting lines. All right, so I've got the quilt set up and I did roll it. Um, usually I just stuff it in the broach space of my machine, but because I'm essentially quilting from the very bottom of the quilt on up so I can do my, my um, rows, I, it wasn't gonna fit and I didn't wanna deal with it. So I did go ahead and roll it. And so now I'm gonna start. I went ahead and I pulled up my bobbin thread and that's down here. And here's my top thread. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and start by doing a locking stitch. There we go. All right, so now I can go ahead and start sewing. And I just have to be mindful of my roll to make sure I'm moving it along with this section of the quilt. So, here we go. Straighten it out down here too. That's the only bad thing about rolling it is it can be a little bit cumbersome to deal with it and make sure that the rest of your quilt is nice and flat. Because if it's not flat up here, it's not going to be flat underneath. And underneath is where you really need to be careful because you can get a pucker in your backing fabric and not even know it until you're completely done with the quilt and you're inspecting it at the very end. So yeah, you definitely want to make sure it's as flat as possible up here. So as I'm pulling my roll through, I'm adjusting it in my lap. And I'm adjusting it underneath the roll in here. Okay, so we're a couple of inches. We're probably about five and a half inches away from our first seam line that we're going to be crossing over. And this is where you want to make sure that you're pulling it nice and tight so that you don't have any puckers in your fabric when you get to that first seam line. Okay, so I'm about an inch and a half away from that seam line. See, so this is the seam line I'm talking about and we're just gonna cross right over top of it. But again, that's why you wanna make sure it's nice and flat because if you end up having something like this on the top, you're gonna to have something like that on the back too. Not put a wrinkle in it, but 
you guys get the idea. Okay, so I'm still going to be pulling it open so I can make sure I get it right in between the two fabrics. Right over it, no problem. Okay. It's kind of wrinkled underneath my roll, so I'm just straightening that out. Hope you guys can still see. Okay, so on to the next one. And sometimes you can only go a couple of inches before you have to readjust. And so it can be a little bit of a slow process, but that's all right. There we go. Okay. Let's see, only a couple of inches and then I gotta readjust. Smoothing it out on the bottom side. So we're a couple of inches away from our next seam line. See, my roll is starting to pop up. So I really hope you guys can still see. And I'm coming into these two fabrics that are, they're different colors, but they're still pretty close, and it's going to be difficult to get right in the middle there, but we'll make do. Finish up this line. Okay, we're almost to the end. And if that, the end of that roll is sticking up, I'm sorry. <laughs> So we're coming to our border, so I'm going to stop and then I'm going to back stitch. And go back forward again. There we go. Alright, so I'm going to go in and cut that thread. Since I'm at the end of the quilt, I'll go ahead and take it out and flip it over so you guys can see the back. Okay, so here's the back section of the quilt that I, or the quilting that I just did. So these two lines here were the lines that I did for my columns. This line here is the first line of quilting that I did for my bottom row of the quilt. So, I mean, you can see here, it looks very, very nice. I don't have any puckers. So let me go ahead and zoom in so you guys can get a better look at that. And hopefully it'll focus for you. There we go. Okay. There. See? Look at that. There, it didn't gather up. It didn't do anything that it should not have done. And this is because I pulled the backing fabric really tight when I was laying it out. So let's go ahead and move up. And here we go. See? So like if you're not careful, like if I pushed enough, I could get it to fold over. And like it could do this. And then you, if you sewed over that, you're forever going to have that little seam right there in the back of your quilt and like I said if you do that 
and you don't realize it until the very end, I mean, it's, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even want to try and figure out how to fix that. See, now I put a wrinkle in it, but, but it looks very, very nice. There's no overlapping. There's nothing right there in that little seam line. I think I've got one more seam line down here, but I don't know if you guys will be able to really see it. If I can grab it. There we go. See, but it stopped because I haven't completed the rest of my row. So, but even so, it looks good already. I love it. I love when things come together. <laughs> All right, so that's that. So now I'll just keep quilting the rest of my lines. Um, I'm going to finish doing the rest of my rows, and then once I get all of that done, then I'll come back and I'll show you guys the next step of the quilting that I do, which is quilting around or in the individual blocks. Okay, so the next step is going to be quilting the individual blocks, and I've chosen to start on this Shimmering Nights block here. Um, it's, it's relatively easy. It's gonna, I'm going to quilt around this little half moon here. So it should be, you know, pretty easy, nice, smooth curves. They're not very sharp, nothing like that. Now I went ahead and I did change my foot. So you can see it there. That is my quilting foot. Um, if you remember, for the last step I had on my walking foot. So this is my quilting foot. So, all right, there we go. So let me get set up and we'll go ahead and start quilting. Okay, so this is the block that we're starting with. I went ahead and took out, there was a safety pin right around here. I went ahead and took it out so that it won't get in the way of my quilting. And I'm going to start up here at the point of this little moon. So I'm just kind of eyeballing where I want my needle to go so I can bring up my bobbin thread. There we go. All right. So we'll pull up that bobbin thread. Oops. Keeps running away from me. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now you just want to go slow. Now I will say before I started doing this, I have a um, a sample quilt that I use to practice my free motion quilting on. I went ahead and did a little bit of quilting on that just to kind of get warmed up because I, you know, you don't want to start off on um, either a client's quilt or a quilt that has a lot of meaning without warming up first. So I went ahead and did that, got my quilting glove, and I'm just going to go slow. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow, I'm just going to trace right around the moon and um, I will have to go through a little bit of the logo. And you'll see what I'm talking about once I get to the wording, because the wording and the moon is connected. So, alright, so I'm going to start off with a couple of stitches right there at the beginning just to kind of lock it in place. There you go. Alright, so now I'm going to start by going on the top side first. And once you get comfortable with your speed and stitching, then you can increase it if you like. If not, there's nothing wrong with staying slow and steady. Okay. Just adjusting my quilt a little bit. All right. I'm just trying to stay as close to that moon as I can without going into it. And every time I need to readjust my hands, I am waiting for my needle to finish in the quilt so it'll hold my place. Okay, so now I'm starting to come up to the lettering. Let me get a little bit closer. There, okay, so now right here you can see what I'm talking about by how the moon and the lettering connect, so I will have to go through that, but it's not a big deal. I'm just making sure everything is nice and flat. All right. There's 
There's nothing wrong with going slow and steady. Just as a reminder, currently my feed dogs are down. All right, so we've got maybe about another three inches left before we get to the tip of the moon on the bottom side. Okay, so we got about a half inch left. Okay, so what I'm going to do is as I get towards the very tip of this moon, I'm going to stop and then I'm going to start coming back so I can go back on the inside of the moon. And that will give us that really nice sharp point at the very tip. Okay, so I'm stopping and I'm going to come back up on the top side. your hand speed needs to increase as well. That'll give you that nice consistent stitch length. Okay, so now this is where it's going to get a little bit tricky because my logo is actually behind my foot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up my foot and rotate my quilt just a little bit. Now I'm not going to move the whole thing because I don't need to. I have enough quilt here to play with. But I am just going to turn it a little bit so that I can see where I'm going there. And that's a good idea to do when you're doing your quilting because if you can't see where you're going, then you're not going to get a very good stitch because you're going to be unsure. There we go. All right, so now I'm going to continue on. You guys can still see that. So now, if I wanted to, now I could turn my quilt back to the way it was since I've come out of that portion of the moon that was behind. But what I'm going to go ahead and do is while I stopped, I'm going to go ahead and cut my threads from the very beginning of that moon. There you go. This way I don't have to worry about them as I come to the end of my moon here. So I'm going to put my glove back on. All right, so I've got a couple more inches and then we'll be done with the moon. Oop, helps put the foot back down. <laughs> All right. All right so I'm going to adjust my hands one last time. I'm just going to take a few stitches just to make sure my moon has connect. Now I'm going to do a few stitches in place. And now we can go ahead and cut our thread. Now those last few stitches will just lock us in to make sure the stitching doesn't come out. I can't find my bobbin thread. There we go. Alright. So... Let me grab the camera so I can show you guys a close-up of what we just did. Okay, so here's a close-up of what we just did. So you can see the stitching there. See, there's my point. 
looks very nice. Now you can see, I mean, it's, I stay along the shape of the logo, but there are some places where I, you know, come away from the logo a little bit more and places where I'm close. So this, I mean, well, I mean, it still looks fine. It's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but if stuff like that bothers you, that's where this clear thread really comes in handy. Because again, you're not going to see what I just did unless you're actually up on the quilt looking at it like we are right now. So there's the other end. So, but now if this was in white thread, it would be a little bit more obvious. So let me go ahead and show you guys the back. Let's see. Now this will be harder to see because I'm using black thread on the back. But you can still see it. See, that's relatively good. See? So you just have the shape of that moon here on the back of the quilt. Now this you'll be able to see if you have the quilt flipped upside down on your bed or something. You'll be able to see the individual shapes because it leaves the shadows of the, you know, the valleys and stuff so you will be able to see that but only the shape you're not going to see the stitching so there's that see so that looks really nice so all right so that was one block um and i'm looking at it you want to make sure that you do get your quilting within the measurements from what the batting says so this measurement here is a little bit big to leave unquilted so what i might do is I might continue the stars down here. I might do a star like over here and over here. And you're really not going to be able to see it a whole lot because it's the clear thread. But you'll be able to see it on the back. So what I'll do is honestly I'll probably quilt in this star and this one right here. And then I'll carry that pattern on over here. But we'll go ahead and do that a little bit later. Let me find another block that I can do for you guys right now. So we'll go ahead and do this one. So this one, I think what I'll do is I'll just follow this shape right here. And because this extends, what I'll do is I'll come up here, come out, in, out, in, and then I'll continue my shape right here. And I'll probably do the same thing, come on the outside right here, I'll go through that little bit of G from the Vegas, then I'll come back up right here. And then that'll be good to secure this block. And then I could also actually go along with the Vegas here, just because it's really a nice looking V, and I think that'll be really cool on the back of the quilt. So let me go ahead and get this set up, and then we'll go ahead and start quilting this block here. Alright, so... I went ahead and pulled up my bobbin thread and I put my needle in the down position. So now all I need to do are a couple of locking stitches and then I can go ahead and start my quilting around this logo. So let's go ahead and take a couple of stitches and then I'm just going to go right into it. So I like to take three or four and then off we go. And I'm going to stick pretty close to the logo. Um, because this one kind of goes off into different directions, I don't want to go too far away from it. So, and here. I'm going to go ahead and stop so I can take out this pin. Okay, readjust the quilt a little bit. <laughs> Alright, so take that one out. Okay, so, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and go around this silver and red mark here. I had originally planned to just go straight through it, but I plan on going around it um, up at the top of the logo, so I'll go, I'll go ahead and go around it down here too. want to kind of stay um, the same. Just a little bit. Now I do have a needle coming up or a pin coming up over here, but because it's um, not super close to my logo, I'm just going to leave it there for now.
So now I'm going to go around these two little silver bars. I'm going to go ahead and stop. Alright, so uh, I can go ahead and take this pin out now. I was looking ahead to see if I have any other pins that are going to get in the way. And I'm not going to take out my top pin now, just in case. There we go. All right. So we'll go ahead and continue up. So I went through um, a little bit of the G, which I, I knew I was going to. That's all right because it's not necessarily a solid line. So I just cut off my tails from my thread because what I've been doing, well, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue my stitch and I'm going to actually go into my first stitch a little bit so that I make sure it's one continuous line. I don't want to see any breaks. So we're coming to the end, and I reached the end, and now I'm actually going into it a little bit, doing some locking stitches. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trace the word Vegas here, the V. Um, I think I'm going to, yeah, I'll just go ahead and go around all the letters. So. What I'm going to do for that is I'm going to pick up my needle, pick up my presser foot. I'm not going to cut my thread. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag it over here, put my presser foot down, and I'm going to do a couple of locking stitches here. Okay, and now here we go around the V. Now by doing this, I'm saving thread because I'm not having to pull it out and cut it. I'm saving time because I'm not having to pull it out and cut it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so now I'm coming back down to the logo, so I'm going into my original stitching, and I matched it, and now I'm just continuing on with the rest of my V. Here we go, go around, come out a little bit, and again, I'm going to overlap my stitches, and then I'm going to do a couple of locking stitches in there. There we go, so we'll pull that up, and I'm going to jump right on over to my E. And same thing, I'm going to do a couple of locking stitches and then I'm going to get going. Okay, so now this does not connect, so what I'm going to do is the same thing. I'm going to, well, this one I went over my stitching, which is alright. We'll go ahead and travel back up the G. And then we'll go ahead and backtrack to this little tail, go back into my original stitching, and then I'm coming back up. stitches and off we go. So 
So I went into the logo a little bit there. But again, because this is a clear thread, you're not going to be able to see it. And on the back, it's going to look completely natural. The only people that will know that I did that is me and you guys. So that's the end of the word. So now I'll go ahead and cut my thread. Top and the bottom. If I can find it. There we go. All right. So now we have all these little lines of thread connecting. So what we're going to do is we're going to start back over here. I'm going to snip that. Snip. I'm going to set that aside so I can get the rest of them. Snip. And because we did those locking stitches, we don't have to worry about any of these stitches coming out over time after washing or anything like that. So it's nice and secure. So we go ahead and throw these little threads away. And now I have to do the same thing for the threads on the back. So, and that's the same way again too. So I'm just going to pull this out and flip it. There we go. All right, so now I just find my first thread, which is right here. So snip, snip, and I hope you guys can see. I know I zoomed in for this shot, so I don't know. This might be out of your camera frame. But if you can't see it, pretty much I'm just snipping all the little threads. <laughs> there we go. All right, so let me grab the camera, and I'll show you guys a close-up here. So you can try and see, remember it was in the G where I crossed over my stitching, which was a mistake, but it's going to look completely fine back here. So let me grab the camera and show that to you guys. Alright, so here's the lettering. Now granted it's all upside down and backwards, um, but there is, let's see, right there is where I crossed over my stitching line and again it was an accident but it doesn't look bad on the back side see and let's see there you go see so you can see it there see so any mistakes that I know I made on the front look just fine on the back which is good plus because I did this with the black thread on the back my um, well it's it's allows it allows forgiveness <laughs> so you can't really see mistakes but again mistakes that I make aren't going to be noticed by other people it's going to I'm going to notice it because I know that I made a mistake but nobody else is going to notice it all right so let's go ahead now I have been doing some quilting on the rest of the quilt so I'll just go ahead and show that to you guys right now um, I've got most of it done. I actually only have a few blocks left, but, um, so I'll show you this one. So, this in memory of Bo, Emily, and Morgan. You can see, I did, I traced around it, but I went kind of far. And actually, I used my, my foot as my guide. So, where the needle was, I kept the logo right on the outside of my foot all the way around. So, that's how I got that nice little fluff to it and it adds kind of like a nice little I don't know it makes it look poofy which I kinda like <laughs> so I just went around all of them just like that there you go and let's see let me show you guys this one here well here's the palm tree one so for this one I stitched right down here and you can't even see it because I got so close and then I stitched around the palm tree I did the little coconuts and then I came out into each of the palm leaves right here. Now I didn't go around all of the palms. I just went straight down the middle and then back, up and back, up and back. Um, but this shirt here, now this is one of the shirts that the logo was up here at the top and there was nothing else below. So what I did was instead of doing the slits that I had originally thought I was going to do, I just, I measured this out which was nine and a half, um, 
inches. And these two lines were an inch and a half apart. So I measured down an inch and a half, inch and a half, inch and a half, all the way down. And then I did another line right underneath it, but I shortened it by an inch. So this is nine and a half, eight and a half, seven and a half, six and a half, all the way down. And that's what I did. So it's like a little pyramid here. Now you can still, I, I drew, I used a marking pencil on here. Not a marking pencil, but it's uh, my disappearing ink pen that I used on here. And it's already starting to disappear. It used to be a bright purple, but now it's because of the air. It's air soluble. But So now you can see it's like a nice little pyramid. And I think it goes pretty good in here. I thought it looked pretty nice. So let's see, what else can I show you guys? Like I said, I've been doing this pretty much all day today. So this one here, um, again, I used my quilting foot as a buffer, so I'm a little bit away from the logo. Let me see if I can show that to you guys. Let me grab my phone. I've got my flashlight on so that y'all can see. We got some storms coming in, so it's kind of dark out. but. So there you can see how I'm a little bit away from the logo, all the way around. And then I also quilted in this line right here. I quilted all the way around right here, which got a little difficult down here because this line is much more narrow than it is up here. So yeah. So that's just a bunch of the quilting that I've been doing today so far on this one. And here's another one that I did. Now this one I also left connected. Um, and I still need to go through and cut my connecting, my connecting threads amongst all the letters and everything. Same thing on the back. Here's another one. I quilted this part and this part. So I still have, like I said, a couple more blocks to do. And then once I finish quilting all of the individual blocks, then um, we'll move on to the next section which will be actually quilting on the um, the border. So once I get everything done, then we'll go ahead and secure down our border and go in all the joining lines. So let me go ahead and finish up these last couple of blocks and we'll move on to the next step. Okay, so I have finished quilting all the individual blocks of the quilt. So now it's time to sew down our border. Um, now, I'm going to start up here um, at this seam line. So I'm going to start going down, and for that, you can, do, you can do it two ways. You can pull up your bobbin thread here if you want. Um, I'm not going to do that because I'm actually going to do a locking stitch. Now, you could do that if you pulled your bobbin thread up. You could just take several stitches right there and then go, um, but I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and leave my bobbin thread down below and I'm just going to do a locking stitch. Now I have switched out my foot. I took off the free motion quilting foot and I put my walking foot back on and I brought my feed dogs back up as well. So I'm going to go ahead and lower my presser foot and we'll take a couple of stitches and I'm going to back stitch. All right. Now I'm going to make sure I have my quilt not pulling down so that I can feed it through nicely. Alright, smooth it out and we're ready to go. There we go, pull up some more. And again, you want to make sure you smooth it out each time, just so you know that you have nice crisp lines and you're not going to have any puckers or wrinkles or anything. Alright, so we're coming up to our first sewed seam intersection and that's going to be this one right here. So again, before you get to it, um, now I, I'm, I'm close right now, but maybe about two or three inches before you get to this, you want to make sure you're not going to have any kind of gathering right here because if you have this right here, you're, uh, yeah, don't, you don't want to sew over something like that because then you're going to get a fold and it's going to be like that in your quilt. So, you know, by checking it a few inches before here, 
that'll give you time to try and fix it if you do have something like that. But if you have something like this, there's no way you can fix that. That's like a half inch on each side. That's like an inch difference, and yeah, that's ooh, that that pretty much requires you to take out some stitches to fix that. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna keep flattening it out, and I'm gonna cross over my seam line, and I'm just going right over it. You don't have to do anything special. show you guys a little bit more. Um, I'm not going to show y'all me sewing the entire side side border because that'll get boring I imagine. Let me show a couple more inches. And for this part, because you're doing a very long straight seam, feel free to go whatever speed you're comfortable with. If you want to fly down this seam, by all means, go ahead. Um, Let's see, let's see if I can get it up a little bit faster. There we go. See, so do whatever you're comfortable with. If you want to go slow and steady, definitely do that. Um, you don't want to end up trying to go fast and then veer off course. <laughs> Alright, so I'm just going to keep sewing down the side seam, and once I get a couple of inches from the bottom, I'll go ahead and come back and show you guys what to do at, at one of the corners. Okay, so I've come down to the end of the quilt, and I'm going to show you guys what I like to do when I come down to a corner. So, now depending on how your border is, if you even have a border, if you don't have a border, you're not going to be doing this step, but depending on how your border is pieced, um, your border right here might come all the way down. This particular one doesn't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down the seam and then I'm going to turn the quilt and come out this way and finish it up. Now I could stop. I could stop right here and do a locking stitch and then I could start my seam out here and work my way in. But I'm not going to do that. Um, I personally don't like coming in from the outside of my quilt. Um, I think some people do come in like that. I, I don't like it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down and I'm just going to go right off the edge. And then when I come to do this seam, I'm going to start right here, go forward, do a back stitch, and then start my seam. So let's go ahead and do that. pick up my presser foot. My needle stops automatically in the down position. So if your machine does not have that option, then simply turn the hand wheel on the side to get your needle to stop in the down, and then you can rotate your quilt. Okay, so I'm going to drop my presser foot back down. I'm going to go ahead and remove this pin. There we go. And I'm just going to sew right off the edge. So here we go. So probably about a, I don't know, that's probably about an inch off the edge. And then I'm going to cut my thread. There we go. Now because you came off the edge into the batting, um, you don't have to do a locking stitch because you're going to cut this off and then this part right here is actually going to be encased in the binding so you won't have to worry about any kind of um, unraveling of your thread or anything like that. All right, so we finished that. So now I'm going to turn the quilt, and I'll actually turn the rest of it um, off camera. But um, I'm going to turn the quilt. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start right here, and then I'm going to come down this side seam. All right, and it'll be the same like what I just did, how I showed you guys the starting from the beginning. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do this side seam. And then once I finish that, I already sewed the two other sides of the quilt. So I just have this one left to do. But once I finish that, then I'll come back and I'll show you guys sewing the, uh, the individual gatherings of your border. So like here, I'll do this one. I'll show that to you guys. So let me go ahead and finish up this last seam, or this last side seam. Okay, so I've finished sewing all around my border on all four sides of the quilt. So now the next step is going to be to sew down 
all of the seams where the border, the different colors of my border join together. So I'm going to start right here and I'm going to go ahead and move, remove the safety pins before I start my stitching. This way I don't have to worry about stopping um, when I'm, you know, in the middle of it. So I'm just going to pull out my thread a little bit. Again, I'm just going to start right here. I'm going to back stitch and then I'm going to go right off the edge of the quilt. I'm not going to bother pulling up my bobbin thread. Alright, so there you go. And these will go relatively quickly since there's not very many of them on the quilt. Um, I think there's maybe, um, I think there's six on the top and bottom and I think ten on the sides if I remember correctly. And then all I'll do once I finish is I'll go through and I'll snip off my threads up here. And if there's some in the back, see like right here, you can see a little bit of my um, bobbin thread. So I'll just come through and snip that off too later on. But it's not, I'm not going to do it right now just because I want to get all of these done all at once and then I'll do all of my thread clipping all at once. So, there you go. And before I start, I'm just going to smooth it out, make sure it's laying nice and flat. There you go. Right off the edge. Cut my thread and move on to the next one. And you're just going to do this. Well, this is what I do on my borders, but um, you don't have to. Like, if you're going to do an all over quilt pattern, you could just do that and you wouldn't even have to worry about going down the individual seams. But since I'm not doing an all over quilt pattern, I am going to secure these down by going by doing what I'm doing now. So I think I'll do one more. So I'm sure you guys will get the hang of it. There we go. And I'm just straightening this out. keep doing this all along the four sides of my quilt and then once I finish with that we'll go on to the next step and we're honestly almost done it's very exciting all right okay so now the next step in the finishing of the quilt is to be to prepare your binding now this is the very last step that you're going to be doing for the quilt is attaching the binding so now there are different there are a couple of different ways that you can um, go about binding the quilt so now these are binding their quilt binding that I bought at Joanne or no uh, these I got at Walmart actually um, now I bought these two kind because these were the two that they had there and I wanted to show y'all both of them so that you kind of knew what they were like when you opened it. Um, so now we'll start with this one and I'll just zoom in actually instead of bringing it up to the camera. There you go. So this is bias tape wide single fold. Now I will say I have never used store-bought binding I always make my own I find that it's more cost-effective um, and you can kinda get it I mean if you make it yourself you can use any kind of fabric any print any design any color anything you want whereas if you try and buy it store-bought you're gonna be a lot more limited on colors and design so now this one this bias tape wide single fold again I've never used this before but this is what it looks like it's uh, about one inch, it's just shy of one inch, maybe seven eighths inch. But you open it and it's folded. It's folded in half. Well, it's it's folded, the two edges are folded in. So like that. And this is what it looks like. So now when you open it, this measures about one and a half inches. Again, I've never used this, but I imagine what you would do is you would sew it onto the quilt say this is your quilt make sure it's nice and at the edge okay so you would sew it on um, well it would be on this side actually 
there. So this is the side of your the edge of your quilt. So you would sew your tape on like this. So you would just stitch right down the side and then you do that all the way around your quilt and then once you finish you're going to flip the quilt over. I'll go ahead and turn it because you want this side to be in your machine throat space. And then you would fold this back over onto this side and then you would stitch down this side or hand stitch. I do all of my binding by the way by machine. I don't do any hand stitching. So this is what the binding, this particular kind of binding would look like on your quilt. It's nice and neat. Now again, this is bias binding. Now what that means is if this is your strip of fabric, this is your selvage, and this is your selvage, and these are the two raw edges, bias is this way. It goes across the grain versus regular binding goes up and down and you could go side to side if you really want to. I've never done it side to side. I always do my binding up and down. Bias binding is going at an angle. It's going crosswise. And the reason for that is by going crosswise like this, you're getting the fabric more stretchy. This way it's very much more stretchy than up and down. And that comes in handy when you're going around circles. So if you have scalloped edges, and scalloped edges are the ones where they're kind of um, like this. It's kind of like a little ripple, you know what I mean? Um, this is where that comes in handy because it's much easier to to maneuver it around the circle of the quilt. Obviously it doesn't look like it right now, but if you're actually sewing it on, it's much easier if you do it on the bias. So that is this right here. And this pack here is three yards, and I don't quite remember how much I paid for it. Um, that probably would have been useful information for you, but I, I don't remember honestly, and I'm sorry. Okay, so the next one, this is double fold bias tape quilt binding and this is also three yards again I don't remember how much it is but this is what it looks like now this one you open it up like this and then you open it up again now this one is much wider than the other one this one is actually three and a half inches so this is what it looks like and these two edges fold in and then this folds in again and then same thing you would do the same process for putting it onto your quilt except this side here is going to be the side that you sew down first so we would sew it down like this on one side of your quilt you stitch down here and then you would flip your quilt over I'm going to turn it around and then you would, well, maybe it's easier if I showed you this way. So you sew down here, and then you're going to pull your binding over, fold it over like that. Actually, that's pretty thin, so, well, it looks like that's the only way to do it. Again, I've never used this binding, so I'm not 100% positive, but I imagine you sew it down here, and then you flip it over, if I can do it, and fold it down this way. Now this is very complicated the way I'm doing it <laughs> and I hope you guys are getting the gist of it but that's the back and then this is what it'll look like in the front. Just a lot better I'm sure. <laughs> so there's that. All right, turn it over. But yeah, so this is the other kind of binding that Walmart had available. There we go. But again, I always make my binding um, but if you don't have the time, it can be a little bit, um, time, uh, I mean, it takes a little bit of time. It's not terrible. I mean, if you're, if you're doing all of this to do the quilt, then you obviously have a little bit of time available. So making your own binding isn't going to be a huge, you know, time consuming thing. So I'm just going to put these away and then I'm going to show you guys how I make my binding. And it's actually really easy and like I said it's very cost effective because you could buy a yard of fabric say on sale or on clearance even and I always I usually use black binding on my quilts unless a client asks for a specific color or design or something like that 
So you could get very nice cotton fabric um, in black or even any other solid color, usually on clearance, or get a coupon for Joanne Fabrics or something like that. You can get it 50% off sometimes. So what I like to do, and I'm going to start with some of the material that I'll be using for the binding on this quilt. Now you probably recognize this material because this is the same material that I'm using on the border. Now my client sent enough material for me to do a border and a binding out of the colors, all the same colors. So here we go. So again, you can buy a yard of fabric on clearance, say for three, four, even six dollars, and you can get a lot of binding out of a yard of fabric. I mean, it's, it's really, really easy to do it. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is lay out your fabric nice and neat. Now, I ironed this fabric prior to laying it out so it's nice and smooth and flat. And I've got my ruler here. This ruler here is 6 inches wide by 24 inches um, long. So, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to start off by smoothing out this edge over here and I'm just lining up my ruler. I went ahead and lined my fabric up here on one of the lines. So now I'm going to go ahead and chop off, it's about a quarter of an inch. I'm going to chop off just so I know I'm working with a smooth edge. There. Okay, so now I do my binding at two inches, but you can do it two inches, two and a quarter, two and a half, however wide you want your binding. I like doing mine at two inches though. So now I'm going to cut at two inch intervals. Okay, so I'm lining it up. All right. Okay, so there's one strip. Now I'm going to scoot my ruler over another two inches. And I'll cut another strip. And I'm going to do this, I think I'm going to cut probably about four strips, I think ought to be sufficient. So that's two. Like it didn't make it through all the way on this one. There you go. All right. So now I can move this fabric aside. And now I'm left with this. So first, before I move the bottom half, I'm going to go ahead and cut off my selvage down here. So let's see. I'm going to cut off probably about an inch or so. Line that up. And I'm just going to cut through all four of them all at the same time. And that's garbage. There. Alright, so now I'm going to actually cut this into smaller strips. Now my border strips are 12 inches long by 3 inches wide. So because I'm using the same colors for my binding that I used in my border, I want them to be different lengths so that none of the seam lines potentially end up meeting up together. So I decided to go ahead and do my binding strips at seven inches finished. So I need to cut them at seven and a half inches right now. So I'm going to go ahead and measure out seven and a half inches. So I'm lining up my ruler. And I'm going to cut again through all four of them all at the same time. There you go. Okay, now I need to do another seven and a half. Cut through all four again. There you go. Okay, so there's that. And now I'm left with these pieces. Now they're not long enough for me to be able to cut off the fold. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open them up. I'm going to lay them down on my mat. I'm just going to stack them on top of each other. I'm going to lay, make sure they're nice and stacked neatly. This way I can get some nice clean cuts. So now, measure seven and a half. Oops. Okay, so let me move that out of the way. So we'll cut right here. There we go. And go right through it. There we go. So this is extra leftover. So now I've got this. Now I just need to stack all of these up. And then I'll be done cutting my blue strips. Then I'll do this for the rest of my colors. So I still have my yellow, purple, and gray colors to do. So there. And you just stack them all up. And then once you get everything cut and ready to go, then we can actually start piecing them together. So I'm going to finish stacking these up. And I'm going to go ahead and cut all the rest of my colors. And then we can go ahead and move on to the next step. Okay, so I finished cutting all of my strips from all four of my colors, so now we're going to start piecing them together. Now there are a couple of different ways that you can piece your binding, and I'm going to show that to you guys now before we start sewing. And I'm going to use a couple of scraps here. All right, if I can get them separated. There, okay. So, now there's, let me zoom in a little bit actually so you guys can see. Okay, so now one way that you can piece your binding is by sewing the seams straight across like this. And a lot of people do it this way, and that's fine, it looks really good, but there's another way that you can do it too. And it's... It's similar to mitering, to, um, if you've ever heard of mitered corners, it's kind of the way that you um, sew the corners of your quilt. But the way that goes is, it'll be, I'm trying to think how I can show you guys. So it would be folded down like that, and then the blue would be... like that. And that's how it would look. This is how you would sew it together. I mean, not by folding it under, obviously. But um, that's another way to do it. So I'm going to show you guys how to do both. In case you've never done either, I'll show you guys how to do both. So now, to do the mitered borders, what you can do is you can do it kind of two different ways. You can do it by lining your two pieces of binding up perfectly square like that or you can off center them a little bit like that. I personally prefer to off center it um, but you can do it either way. Honestly both ways will give you a good um, nice looking miter. So then what you want to do is you're going to draw a line from this corner down to this corner where the two fabrics meet. So going to line that up and the pen that I'm using, I'm using my purple pen, this, this side is disappearing ink, the blue side is Mark Be Gone, and this one will disappear with water only, whereas the disappearing ink disappears with air um, or water. So, I'm just going to draw that line right there. There we go. And I'm doing it kind of thick because this stuff tends to start disappearing pretty quickly. So there's our line. So now you can hold it like this. You can pin it. I've got some wonder clips that I can use. There we go. All right. So I got my little wonder clips here. Slide it under there, there, and over here, like that. There we go. So I'll move that to the sewing machine. And then the other way 
you can do it. Like I said, is just with the straight seam. And that is just you take your two fabrics and you lay them pretty sides together. And I didn't mention that with this one, but you want your fabrics to be pretty sides touching. So you want the faces to be touching each other. There. So with this one, you just lay it pretty sides together. And then you would just do your normal quarter inch seam right here. So let's go ahead and move to the sewing machine. And I'll show that to you guys. So a little bit more. There we go. All right. So, I'll do the straight one first since that's relatively easy. I don't have to remove any clips. Alright, so like I said, you just go a quarter of an inch and you just sew straight down. Alright, so now I'll go ahead and do this one at the same time. And you just want to sew right on your little line right there. sewn together then you'll use your iron and press them open I'm just going to finger press for right now there so for the first um, I, I don't know for the first couple if you're going to do them at an angle I recommend not cutting off your excess material until you turn it over give it a nice finger press to make sure that everything lined up because it's easy to get it um, not lined up and then you're gonna have to redo it. So let me bring these over here so that you guys can get a good look. There we go. Alright, so again this one here is just the straight seam and I know it's a little blurry but because the colors are so contrasting, you can really see it. So this is what it would look like. So once we finish putting all of our binding together, what you would end up doing is you would iron it, press it straight down the center, and this is what your actual binding strip would look like. See, so that's a nice little seam right there. And then here's this one. Okay. And I like the way this one looks. It just kind of gives it that extra little, almost like complicated look, you know what I mean? And it's really not much more complicated than this one. See? And so once you know that it's lined up, once you know that your top down here, or up there, and your bottom down here is good to go, then you grab a pair of scissors, and you just cut off, cut about a quarter of an inch. There you go. And you can do it with a rotary cutter too. You could lay them all down and go through a couple of them all at the same time. And then, like I said, once you get it all done, you just press it open with your iron. And then you'll have that nice little gathering. And fold it. Because again, this is what you'll do with your binding once it's all completed. You'll end up folding it and then that's what your binding strip will actually look like on the quilt. So it's really nice. It kind of just adds that little extra bit of detail to it, you know what I mean? And because the seam is off center versus this one, once you sew this or iron it, you're going to have all of those layers of fabric to sew through when you're putting your binding on. So you've got four, five, six layers of fabric that you're going to have to go through because you can't press the seam. I mean, you could cut it and then press it opposite so that you could nest your seams, but that's an awful lot of work. So when you're sewing your binding on, you're going to have to go through six layers of fabric by having a seam like this. Versus this one, we're only going to have to go through four layers of fabric. So it's two less layers to go through. See? So the kind of seams that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using this on my binding instead of the straight seam just because, like I said, it adds that little bit of um, detail to it. So I'm going to go ahead and start piecing some of these together. Now I don't draw lines on all of mine. 
Um, but if you're first starting out, if this is your first time doing it, I definitely recommend you draw your line so that you can make sure it stays um, pretty accurate. So I'm going to go ahead and put my binding in the order that I want them. Make sure you guys can still see. Yep. Okay. Now, usually, like I said, I usually do my binding um, in solid black. And because it's solid black, they're long strips. So instead of cutting my binding into sections like this, I leave them long. I cut off the selvages, and then that's it. So you have about 40 inches worth of fabric that you can just add one right after the other, and you can get all the binding that you need relatively quickly. But because these are so much shorter, it does take a little bit longer to do it. And um, because they're so short, I can't pull this side up and add another strip onto it because the angle wouldn't be right. But when they're longer, you can just chain piece this. So you could do this, pull up the very end of your strip, which like I said, is 40 inches away. Lay it here, lay your next one on. You don't even have to take it out from under the presser foot or anything. But because these are so short, I have to. Or I could sew two of them at a time, which is what I'll show you guys here. All right, so. All right. So I'm going to take the same colors, and I'm going to sew a second strip. And then what I can do is once these get, you know, a good length, I can just sew them together. So now, I'll cut off this back one and add my next colored strip to it. If this is your first time, I definitely recommend either using pins or drawing your lines so that you make sure you get a nice, good seam. There we go. Well, once you get the hang of it, you'll be able to do it like I'm doing. See? I hope you guys can see. But I didn't draw my line, and it's still a very nice seam right there. So, and then this is what I'll keep doing till I have enough binding to go all the way around my quilt plus mm, you want like a foot extra just so that you can make sure um, you have enough to join your two ends of your binding at the very end. And I did the math and I think I need about 250 inches of continuous binding so I can make it all the way around my quilt. Um, but, you know, obviously before I start sewing it on, I'll definitely start, I'll lay it down on the actual quilt itself just to make sure that I'm going to make it and then I can add more strips if I need to. Alright, so like I said, that's pretty much it. So I'm going to keep doing this until I get enough binding together. And then once I have it all together, then I'll go ahead and show you guys the next step, which will be to iron it, um, cut off all these little dog ears, iron it nice and flat, and then actually iron it in half. So, yeah, all right. Okay, so I've got all of my binding put together, and now I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is actually ironing all of the seams down in one direction. So for that, now usually when I do my binding, I set my seams first, but again, that's when my binding is like each strip right here is 40 inches long, so I don't have a seam, you know, every few inches. Since these are so close and there's so many seams, I'm not going to bother setting my seam first. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, iron on the back side and just flatten them out instead. Um, so, we'll go ahead and start that. I've started a few over here already. I have my iron set to cotton and I do have steam on. So what I'm doing is I'm just laying it down, face down onto the ironing board. And I'm pushing my iron right against that seam. 
and then going on to the next one. And I'm just letting it sit for a little bit so the steam can get on there. Let's get a little part of it came back. <laughs> and then I'm just pulling it down, doing the same thing here. There we go. And you'll just do this for your whole binding strip. And I'm at the end already. I've already done everything else, so I'm at the end. There you go. There. Perfect. So here is what it looks like on the front. Very nice. All right, so now we can move on to the next step. Okay, so for that, I'm going to zoom out, and I'm going to move the camera so you guys can see. Actually, I'll put it behind. I always find that when the sun is behind me, you're able to see it better. There we go. All right, so now for this, I like to use the length of the ironing board so that I have all of this space that I can iron. And I'm just pulling my binding over here to be on this side of the ironing board. And go all of this. There you go. All right. So now I'm just going to let it pile up on the floor down here at the end of the ironing board. All right. So we've got this entire length of ironing board that we'll be able to iron and fold our binding in half and then actually iron it that way. And that's what we'll do right now. Make sure you guys can see everything. That's good. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what you want to do is usually what I like to do is I like running my iron down the length of the binding first so I can heat it up. And I'm not doing it fast. I'm just kind of doing it slow just so I can heat up the fabric. And then... I start folding it. Now you want to fold it um, so that it's ugly sides, I guess you could say, touching. There you go. So I do the first part of it and then I set my iron down and then I just start folding it and I'm slowly keeping my iron right on that binding. So it's getting a nice connection and it's getting a good amount of steam. There you go. And then once you come to the end, just let it sit for a second. Pick it up. And then I start like right around here. And I pull my binding up. And then again, you can iron it to heat up that material. Get it nice and pliable. Not that it's not already, but you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. And then put my iron right back on it. And I start folding the rest of it. And you're going to do this throughout the entire length of your binding, all the way to the end. And this is pretty much it. This is how you make your binding, or how I make my binding. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can do it. There's actually a tool, it's called, I think it's just called the binding tool. And it's, I don't have one, but it's a little tiny piece of metal that you push your fabric in and it's just like a little tiny clip and you push your fabric in one way and it folds it for you like when you push it in through the back it's wide like this and then you pull it through and it folds the fabric as you pull it through so that when it comes out the end you have your iron here already and you just pull it out iron pull it out iron and you don't have to worry about like what I'm having to do which is fold it and make sure it's nice and even. Um, and there is also, there's, a, there's another machine, um, I don't know what it's called, but I've seen a couple of YouTube videos on it, where it actually heats the binding up for you, and it does the same thing. It heats it up, and then it actually um, folds it and presses it for you already, so you don't even need an iron to use it. It does everything for you right there. But, like I said, I don't remember the name of it, but I'm sure if you were to go on YouTube and search for, you know, how to make binding or homemade binding, something like that, I'm sure it'll pull it up. 
Um, I'm trying to think. I almost want to say Jenny from Missouri Star Quilt has tried it before. Um, or maybe it was um, the Crafty Gemini. I don't remember, but I know I've seen it on YouTube before. But, yes, this is how I do my binding. Um, and like I said, I think it's much more cost effective to do it yourself than to buy the, the pre-made binding strips. Um, like I said earlier, you can use any fabric you want to make your binding. So you're really not limited to any kind of pattern or color or anything like that. So that's why I really like doing this. So, yeah, so this is pretty much it, honestly. I'll just keep doing this throughout the rest of my binding strip. And then once I finish pressing it, then it'll be time, time to actually attach it to the quilt itself. So, yeah, all right, so I'm going to finish up this, and then we can move on to the next step in the um, completing of the quilt, which will be actually sewing your binding onto the quilt. Alright guys, so we're just about ready to start putting our binding on, but before we can do that, we have to cut off this extra batting and backing fabric from all the sides of the quilt. Now I've already done the three sides, this is the last side that I have left to do. So what I like to do is I like to lay the side that I'm working on down on a flat surface, this way we can make sure that our quilt is laying nice and flat. And I like to smooth it out along the whole length. And then I also like to give the backing fabric just a little tug just to make sure it's not folded underneath or anything. And do that along the whole length. There you go. Now this is also where I will go in and I'll trim off the, um, the little extra threads from when I sewed these seam lines. So you just go in and snip those off. There you go. Alright, and then once it's nice and smooth, then you can use either a pair of scissors or even a rotary cutter and just cut. You want to cut flush along with your border. Or if you don't have a border, you would cut flush along with your blocks. So I'm going to start in this corner over here. And I pretty much have my blade right against that border. I'm not cutting into the border, but I have it right against that border. And I'm using this hand to keep the quilt in front of my scissors on the table so that it doesn't potentially um, pucker or get uneven or anything like that. And doing this, you also get to get rid of all these little extra um, little threads from your border which I find quite annoying, but <laughs> there's nothing you can do to get away from that. So now what I like to do is right now, my border, these strips here are each 12 inches. So to keep it from flapping around, I'm going to put a pin right in the middle of each of these, just so I don't have to worry about my batting getting pulled out, or my backing fabric potentially getting folded under, or anything like that. One more. There, all right. So now I just have to move my quilt up a little bit so that I can continue trimming off the extra batting. And when you're doing this, just give a quick peek underneath to make sure your quilt hasn't folded on itself and um, That'll, that'll make sure that you don't accidentally cut into your quilt while you're cutting off the extra batting and backing fabric. There. So, now I'm just going to smooth it out. There go. And again, I'm just going to give my backing fabric a little tug. Alright, perfect. Cut off the extra threads, 
think I got that one already. You don't see one. aside for now. I'm going to go ahead and put my safety pins in. Okay. That one. And that one. And this one. Alright, so now you're going to do that to all the edges of your quilt. And then once that's done, then you can actually move on to the very last step, which is attaching the binding to the quilt. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get my sewing machine set back up, and then we can go ahead and do that. Okay, so now we can start sewing our binding on. So because I do all of my binding by machine, I start sewing my binding on the back. I start sewing my binding on the back first, this way, when I start flipping it over and I sew it on the front, I decide where my stitching is going to go. This way I know it will look good versus if you sew it on the front first and then you fold it over and then you sew it on the back, you have no idea where your stitching is going to end up on the front side of the quilt. So I'm going to start sewing mine on the back first. And what you want to do is you want to leave about a foot or so worth of binding um, loose up here. So I'm actually going to start sewing. I've got all of this binding here, but I'm actually going to start sewing right here. And you want to do that this way when you come back all the way around your quilt, you're able to join your binding, your two pieces of binding together and make it a seamless transition. So now the thread that I have in my machine, I have white thread in my spool up top and in my bobbin because you're not going to see any of the stitching. So I'm going to use white and I currently just have my regular quilting foot on or my regular, um, it's the standard quarter inch foot but you could put your walking foot on if you want or if you need to. I'm not going to use it right now though. So I'm going to go ahead and get this all lined up and you're just going to sew along the edge like normal. You just want all of your layers to be lined up together and you're just going to sew down like you're doing a normal quarter inch seam. And you want to make sure you do a locking stitch in the beginning. All right. So I'm going to start sewing. I'm going to do a couple of stitches and then I'm going to back stitch. And you want to start somewhere kind of in the middle of one of your sides. I'm towards the end. I've got about, probably about a foot and a half before I get to my first corner. Um, but if you start like right at a corner, that's not a good idea because then you're going to have to try and do your minor corner and that's going to be very difficult. So, but I started towards the bottom, this way I could show you guys how I do my corners in case you've never done one before. There you go. So I'm coming up to my corner here. I'm going to go ahead and take out my safety pin, but I will put a little wonder clip. I 
mention it earlier, I'm sewing my binding on. These are my raw edges right here. Let me open that up. This is my raw edge, so this side here is my nice finished edge. You want to start sewing your raw edge down first because what's going to happen is once you get this stitched down, you're actually going to be flipping this around to the other side so your raw edges are going to be encased. Alright, so we've come, we're about three inches from the bottom, or from my corner. And what you're going to do is you're going to come about a quarter of an inch before the end of your quilt. And then you're going to pivot and you're going to come off your quilt at a 45 degree angle. And that's what's going to get you that nice mitered corner. So... So you're just going to pick it up, give it a little turn, and you just want to turn it so that when you keep going forward, your needle is going to come right off the corner of the fabric. So, there you go. And then you can actually pull this out and away, because what you're going to do now you're actually going to bend your binding so that you can get the nice um, miter. So what you want to do is you want to, this is how the binding was, you want to fold it up this way and that stitching right there is going to keep it right where it needs to be. So you fold it like this and it makes a nice continuous line between my backing fabric off into my binding here. So you do that, and then you're going to fold it back down. And what you want to do is you want to line up this fold right here with the edge of your quilt. So I hope you guys can see that. See? And I'll show you guys one more time. So this is how your binding is. What you want to do is you want to fold it up, and then just kind of hold it there with your fingers, and you'll see if this is lined up, then you're doing good so far. <laughs> So that's lined up, so now you're just going to keep your finger right here, and then you're going to pull the binding back down, and you just want to fold it so that it has a nice fold on this side of the quilt. Okay, so you can look at that, that looks nice, everything looks beautiful, and once you get that, then you're going to put your quilt back under your needle, I'm going to tuck those threads in there. And it's alright to have those threads um, hanging out like that. They're going to be encased in the binding anyway, so don't worry about that. Pull that out of the bag. There we go. Alright, so now let's do a couple of stitches so that you can get readjusted. There we go. Okay, and then you just line your binding up like normal. Go. All right, and then you just keep going down the side. There. And your speed might be a little limited because the logos of the shirts are face down on my extension table. And the way those logos are, they're kind of like a plastic um, rubbery material or you know what I mean and because of that they kind of grip onto my table surface here so you might be a little bit limited on just how fast you can go but um yeah I mean I don't, I don't really know of a way to alleviate that honestly <laughs> sewing around all the sides of my quilt just like how you saw. I'm going to do all of my corners the exact same way. And um, if you've never done a mitered corner before, there are tons of videos out there showing how to do it. Um, I learn how to do my corners by watching other people's YouTube videos. So um, definitely check them out. Um, some of the ones that I recommend is some of the videos from the Missouri Star Quilt Company. 
Um, Jenny Doan has all the tutorial videos out there and she's done a couple showing how to do mitered corners. Also check out the Crafty Gemini. She has a bunch of videos out there too showing how to do mitered corners. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Um, you could see Leah Day, it's L-E-A-H space D-A-Y. She might have a video showing how to do mitered corners. I know she does a lot of free motion quilting, but I don't know if she has one out there showing how to do mitered corners. But definitely check her out anyways, just because, like I said, she does a bunch of videos on free motion quilting, which would come in handy. So, like I said, I'm just going to keep going down the side of this quilt here, and then I'm going to finish up the other three sides. And what I'll do is when I get to the end, I'll come back and show you guys how I join my two binding strips. Okay guys, so I'm just about to come to the end of my binding where finally both ends meet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of more stitches and then I'm going to go ahead and lock in or do a locking stitch. So. I'm not going to go very far in, just maybe about four inches or so. That's about good. Alright, so now I'm going to go ahead and do a locking stitch. Very good. And I'm going to cut my thread. Alright, so here is this end, and this is all my binding. So I had, uh, I think I had about actually three extra feet. Um, which is good. I'd rather have too much than not enough. So here's one end and here is the other end. So I left probably about an eight inch gap in there and you want to leave yourself enough space so that you can actually join your two pieces of binding. Now there are a bunch of different ways to do this honestly. Um, and really no one way is right or better than the other. Um, so I'll just show you guys a couple of different ways that I've seen. Now one way is where you would just do a straight stitch. So what you would do is you would figure out, I'm going to put my presser foot down to hold that, but you would pull both ends of your binding kind of tight to figure out where they're going to actually join. So mine would join right here. So what I could do is I could cut it about a quarter inch um, where it's tight right here against the backing fabric. And I know I'm not doing a good job of explaining it, but I would cut it a quarter inch up, cut it straight across, and then what you would do is you would open, I'll do it right here. So let's pretend this here is the cut that I just did and let's pretend this is the cut that I just did. So once you cut it and you have it measured out, you would open your two pieces of binding like this and then you would go ahead and sew a quarter inch seam right here and then your two pieces of binding would then be together and it's obviously it's difficult to do it because they're not actually sewn together but that's what they would look like and then it would just fold over like normal. So your two pieces of binding would be, you know, like that, but a lot better looking. <laughs> okay, so that's one way, and it would be a straight seam. So instead of these, these are not straight seams. They're off at an angle. If I was to do that, I would have one straight seam here in my binding. I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to be doing that one today. Now there is another one that you can do where, let me open this up. What I would do is I would cut this right here and then I would actually fold over this yellow piece so that I have a nice finished edge right here. And then obviously this purple piece wouldn't be here. But it would be folded over so it would be yellow right there and it would be finished. And then what I would do is I would insert this remaining piece of my binding you would just insert it like this and then you would cut it off eh, maybe like an inch or two in inside of this yellow right here so you would put it inside like this and again this purple piece is in here so it would look a little bit like that obviously it's not perfect right now 
but you would insert it like that and then you would just finish stitching down right here and then that's it. You wouldn't have to go in and do any additional stitching or anything because once you fold this over it's going to be tight enough that you're not going to be able to get anything in here. Um, so that's another way and that's actually probably the way that I'll do it today. And then the other option is, and I don't know, let's see, the other option would be to continue the seams that I have here by laying them the way we did when we were joining them in the first place. So you would lay it like this and then you would go ahead and you would sew from this corner down to this corner, cut off your extra, and then the piece of binding would open back up and it would look just like these seams right here. I mean, you would just, you, you would literally act like you're adding another strip to your binding to make it longer. So you would just go like this, stitch down here, cut off the extra, and then pop, pop it open and it would look like this, just like that. And then you would just continue sewing down the edge. So, like I said, I'm going to go ahead oops, and do the way the the one where you just insert this part of your binding inside here and go like that. So that's how I'm going to do it today. So, but what you want to do first, if you want to figure out where on this length do you want to do your join. So I think I'm going to do my join a little bit down here so I can get away from the seams. So if I did it right about here, I think that would be pretty good, honestly. And honestly, I could just cut off this purple and do it right here at the yellow, and then I wouldn't have to worry about it. So let's go ahead and do that. Let me get my long scissors. There you go. All right, so I'm just going to cut right along this stitch length here, or this stitching that I did when I connected my two pieces of binding. There we go. So there's that. Okay. So now what you want to do is you want to make sure you fold this under because if I did it like this, this is a raw edge right here on my yellow. It's going to start fraying like this. It's going to start having, you know, stringies and all sorts of craziness hanging off. So to do that, I'm trying to make sure you guys can still see. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to fold this down and I might actually end up taking it over to the iron but for the purposes of this right now I'm just going to finger press it and I did, it's probably about maybe three eighths of an inch pressed down there we go I'm just giving it a nice finger press Okay, and then you can test it and I got this big old little ear hanging off, which is fine. It's going to get, um, well, actually, I'll probably cut that off because it is pretty big. But, so we got that. And then, what you want to do is you just want to kind of eyeball how long this strip needs to be so that you can put it inside. So, I'm just going to go ahead and cut it right down, right above this yellow, I think. Because that will be just long enough for me to get several inches in there but not quite long enough for me to end up running into my stitching here. So, go ahead and cut it. And I'm just going to cut straight across. There you go. So this here is extra. Alright, so then all you do is you just slide that right in. And because we ironed this earlier, we've got this nice little pressing mark here and um, it'll just snuggle right in. And you want to make sure that you're giving it a, you know, keeping it a little bit taut so that you don't end up having either not enough binding or too much. So I'm just putting my finger in there to make sure it's tucked in all the way. There. And then you see it's bunching up a little bit, so all I have to do is pull it just a little bit, make it nice and snug. I'm going to go ahead and cut off this little extra ear. There we go. All right. 
So now the only thing here that kind of bothers me is where my um, my my colors are. So it's got gray, a little bit of purple, and then yellow. So that bothers me a little bit, but um, honestly, I don't think anybody will notice because I did it towards one corner of the quilt. It's not going to be very noticeable, honestly. So. Like I said, I'm going to take this over to the iron, and I'm going to give it a little press, and then I'm going to come back and finish ironing, or ironing, finish sewing this right here down, and then I'll show you guys what it looks like afterwards. Okay, so we're all pressed and we're ready to go. So now, all you got to do is bring it back to your sewing machine, and I'm just going right over the stitching line that I did before. And I'm going to go ahead and start off, I'm going to do another locking stitch. There you go. Alright, so I'll go ahead and remove my little clip that was holding everything down. You just want to make sure you get that little piece right under the presser foot. And then you'll be able to just keep right on going. Everything else is nice and lined up. And then I've met my stitching. So now I'm going to go ahead and do another locking stitch and cut my thread. There you go. Got all these extra little freddies everywhere. So that's it. So that's how you join your two little pieces of binding. See, like right now, I can still get my finger in it a little bit, but once we pull it around, let me show you on this side, once we pull it around to the other side, it'll be, you're only going to have a quarter of an inch there, and um, it'll look just fine. I mean, outside of it being gray, purple, and yellow, but it'll look very nice. So it'll just fold over. See? Hope you guys can see that. So now, what we're going to do is now I'm going to flip my quilt around, and I'm going to actually start showing you guys how to sew it down on the other side. So let me go ahead and flip everything around. Okay, so I've got the quilt all turned around and ready to start sewing the binding on to the front side. Um, but first, I went ahead and I changed out my threads. So I went ahead and I put my clear thread back in for my spool up top. So my stitching on the top of the binding up here will be clear. And then I went ahead and I put black back in my bobbin because... Um, I don't want there to be white thread on the backing here, so I went ahead and put black back in. Alright, so, and I'm going to start down towards one of the corners, this way you guys can see how to um, go about doing the corner. So, now what you want to do first is you just want to start by pulling the binding over, just in one particular section. And you can use pins if you want, I personally don't, I just like pulling it and then just using my fingers to hold it in place. So you just want to pull it, and I went up a little bit so I'm not immediately starting on that um, seam. So you just want to pull it over, and you just want to kind of go off of where this white, my, in my case, where my white thread is, because you want to make sure your binding is going to cover that up. So see, I just pull over a couple of inches at a time, and I use my fingers to hold it in place. So, then what you do is once you get it pulled over where you want it, and you don't have to pull it like, you know, a whole bunch like this. Honestly, you just want enough to cover up that stitching line. And ideally, your needle is going to be going through the binding and right into that stitching line. So that on the back side, it'll be going essentially in the ditch between your binding and your backing fabric. That's, that's what you're really aiming for or what I like to aim for. So, I'm going to realign that. Here we go. And it's always a little more difficult over the seam lines, but over time you'll kind of get used to messing with those. So, I'm putting my binding 
or my presser foot right there on the edge of my binding. Now we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to start with a locking stitch. So we'll take a couple of stitches and we'll back stitch. There you go. So now we can move our fingers. There. So now, while that's nice and secured, I'm just going to go ahead and work my way down and pull over my binding for a couple of inches down. There we go. And just hold that down and then off you go. There we go. Alright, so like I said, I started towards the edge or towards the bottom of one of the corners. This way I could show you guys how to um, sew down the corners. Right. And this can be a little bit of a slow process, um, especially if you're trying to get your needle right in that same seam line. It can be a little bit slow. That's why I'm not going, you know, um, pedal to the metal here. <laughs> Taking my time. So, there we go. There we go. Okay, so we're coming up to the corner. So, now what you can do is you can grab all of these little threads here. And give them a snip, kind of keep them out of your way, kind of have like a nice little clean working space there. Okay, all right. So now I'm gonna go a few, I'm gonna think I'm gonna go like one more inch or two, and then I'm gonna stop and show you guys what I like to do. There we go. Okay, so now there's a couple of different ways you can do the corner. Um, so now you could fold over this edge of the binding and you could come straight down like this and then fold up the bottom edge. Let me grab a clip here. These little clips really come in handy. So you could fold that down and then fold up the bottom edge. And what you want to do is you just kind of want to keep your finger right there and then fold up the bottom. And what that does is it'll give you a nice little mitered corner right here. So you can do it that way, or you could fold up the bottom first. Now I've, I had done this, I tried this mm, a little while back I think, and I found it so much easier um, for me to get the presser foot over top of all of this bulk if I do the bottom side first instead of the side first. So I'm going to go ahead and put one more clip here because I do have a seam right here. So one more right there and push this one in just a little bit. Alright, so I folded up the bottom side first, okay? So then you're going to do the same thing with this side, fold it right on over. I'm just using my finger to settle everything down inside there. So now we'll put another clip here. There. Okay. So now, I mean, obviously that popped back open, but because I did the bottom side first, my presser foot is already going to be on top right here. So when I come here, I'm going to place my needle in the down position right here. I'm going to pivot my quilt and just keep going. And because, like I said, because I folded in the bottom first, I'm not going to have to worry about trying to get my presser foot to stay um, to stay above the fabric if this side was on top. And once you actually start sewing this, you'll completely understand what I'm talking about, and you'll see that doing it this way is so much easier. Because um, I didn't always used to do it this way when I when I first started, so I definitely love this way, and I always do it this way now. So. Go ahead and keep going down. And as you get closer towards the end, you just want to slow down just a bit. Keep your finger there. 
And there. So now it's right under the presser foot. And we'll take one more stitch there. So now we'll pivot. Got my quilt sliding off the other side over there. All right. So we'll pivot, put that foot back down, and I'm just going to slide my wonder clip down just a little bit so that I can get a couple of stitches in. There. So now my foot is sitting flush on the fabric, and now I can take off my little clips here. There. So now I just keep going. Just pull in up the binding. There we go. Keep right on going. Okay. And let me pull this over so I can show it to you guys. So now we have enough that I can show you guys. Actually, let me get the camera so I can show y'all close up what it looks like now. Okay. So here's the edge that we just finished sewing. And again, it's difficult to see the actual stitching because I use that clear thread. But you can see it's maybe about an eighth of an inch into the binding right there. And that's all that you need. And so here's the back. See, and you can just see my thread line right in that backing fabric. And that's why I use the black thread in my bobbin instead of white because you would have been able to see that white thread like a lighthouse in the night you know what I mean I mean it would have been very obvious that it was there and this is where I started I think yeah a little bit up oh, actually it's just a thread but so that's what it looks like let me show you guys the corner so look at how nice that looks very nice here's the back Look at that. It's a beautiful quarter. Very nice. All right, so that's, I mean, that's pretty much it, honestly. You just keep making your way all the way around the quilt. And once you get back to over here where we started, that's it. You're done. The whole thing is done. So I'm going to go ahead and keep sewing on my binding. And it doesn't take very long, honestly. I mean, sewing it to the front takes longer than sewing it to the back because I'm, I'm trying to get my needle right in that stitching line. But you can see it's right in there, <laughs> which is perfect. That's exactly what I want. So I'm going to keep finishing this up. And then once I finish sewing my binding completely on, I'll come back and show you guys the completed quilt. All right, everybody, so I have completed the quilt. All the binding is sewn on, and I don't have video footage of it completed, but I do have a couple of pictures, so I'll go ahead and show that to you guys here at the end of the video. But that's pretty much everything you need to know to get your quilt all put together from putting the sandwich together all the way through finishing the binding. So... Yeah, um, if you have any questions or comments, definitely leave them in the comment section below. I do answer all the questions that I get, and I usually respond to comments. Um, also, check me out on Facebook. I do have a Facebook page, if you've not already seen it. It's facebook.com slash segoviaquilts, or you can just use the link that I put in the description below. Um, what else? I do have some of my quilts out there on Pinterest, so I'm sure if you were to search in Pinterest Segovia quilts, they'll pull up. I have a marine quilt that I did for my husband out there, and um, several of the quilts that I've done for my clients. So, yeah, definitely reach out to me if you have any questions or anything. Um, I'll do my best to answer them for you. So, yeah, alright, well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and until next time, I will see you guys later.